Hi, today we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to look at team leadership. So team leadership is still under the big category of leadership, but we're going to be focusing on real special context, leadership in teams. Now let's start off by defining what a team is because there's work groups and then there are teams and sometimes the difference isn't especially uh, uh, clear what it is. Now first off, we're going to say to to have a team, we have to have a group of people formed for accomplishing a goal. But that's not any different than a, a work group. Um, where uh, the, the team differs is in the intensity of the relations and the interactions that occur. First of all, in a team, there's interdependent, I mean, and true interdependence. The success of individuals depends on the success of the team. That means if the team accomplishes its goal, the, um, the individuals are successful. If the individuals do things right, but the team doesn't accomplish the goal, it's a failure. So there's, there's true independence so that um, uh, the, the team's work stands or falls together as a, as a whole. Um, a second uh, ele defining element of a team is that there's this commitment to work together and to communicate regularly, if not continuously. It's not just go off and, and do your own work and when you're done, you're done. It's you, you work together, you keep everybody informed, the communication is, is uh, continual, and it's only when everybody's work has been accomplished that the team has a c and, and coordinated together that the team... Uh, uh, can be said to have accomplished their uh, their goal. And then a fourth element um, is that it's got to be accountable as a unit in a larger organizational context. So a, a team um, implies that it's a smaller part of an organization, which, which can be obvious, but we're going to see that the rest of the organization can have a big impact on uh, teams. Now, this team leadership perspective by Hill that we're going to uh, look, look at, we're gonna, a new idea that we're going to introduce here is that, um, not, uh, well, first of all, um, let me say that all the research on teams indicates that team success is highly dependent on leadership. Uh, and you've probably experienced that, especially in school uh, teams. Uh, think of some teams that you've had in some classes uh, that's often a miserable experience for uh, for students is doing uh, teamwork because often nobody wants to take leadership uh, for one reason or another, perhaps for legitimate reasons, perhaps not. Um, but a lot of times, especially in my undergraduate classes, I see uh, teams just suffer because of lack of uh, leadership. Um, now, what is interesting about team leadership, and in this, especially this perspective that we're going to be looking at, is that the leadership function doesn't have to be carried out just by a leader. There can be a formal leader, or leadership functions can be shared by other team members. And you can have both. You can have formal leaders, and you can have team members both carrying out leadership uh, functions. And so sometimes this is called distributed leadership, or shared leadership. Uh, teams tend to be fairly flat structures without much hierarchy, perhaps one or two designated leaders, but they tend to be very flat and everybody in the team with continuous communication can give input and, and that way exert leadership in the team. So one of the things that we can talk about in teams is the team leadership capacity, the ability kind of summed over all the members, the abilities that they have to give leadership to the, uh, the team. So this idea of distributed or shared leadership is, is really different because now leadership isn't caused just by one person. Leadership is a function of everybody in a, in a group. So it, it's something that belongs to a group rather than uh, something that, that belongs or is measured in an individual. Now Hill's team uh, leadership model is you look at the picture and you read the text and it's one of the more complex models in the textbook. Um, it's, uh, um, this model is not to say what causes leadership, but it kind of provides what's known as a mental roadmap to uh, um, help diagnose team problems and to take 
appropriate action to correct the team problems, to kind of figure out like, okay, what's going wrong? Uh, what do we need to do? Um, how do we get back on track? That's uh, the purpose of this uh, team leadership model. Now, generally, the uh, um, here's here's a simplified um, version of Hill's team leadership model. This one's not in the textbook. The picture in the textbook, which we'll eventually get to, is quite complex, and I thought it might be easier to start off with just looking at the main component in Hill's uh, uh, model. You kind of like start off, the team is functioning, people are doing work, and whoever's exercising leader leadership, whether it's a designated leader or a team member, uh, you monitor the situation until action is necessary because there's some type of uh, uh, problem. And so you monitor the situation until some type of action, some type of change is necessary, and then someone takes leadership action. It can be the designated leader or it can be a team member. And then after that action has been taken, you look at what the results are. You look at how the team is now performing, how it's developing, how it's functioning, and you can decide if that leadership action was appropriate um, or you keep working on it and you get that back to a steady situation where everybody does their work and you keep monitoring things until uh, additional action is necessary. So it, it kind of follows in this loop. Uh, sometimes it'll go back and forth between these bottom two when you're trying to, to, to take action to make sure it's the right action. You get into a steady state and then you need some more uh, uh, work done on the, the team. So that's the general model of Hill's uh, uh, team leadership model. Now let's look at some of the more detail, some more details, and then we'll put it all together in the uh, illustration that's in the, the book. Now in Hill's model, the people that are exercising leadership need to have, have to make a, a couple decisions. The first decision is when should I intervene in the team? When is it not going well? When you've got everybody doing their work, when should um, there'd be some change be made to the, the team. Well, there's a number of ways of determining when one intervenes. We can look at different things that teams uh, should be doing, um, things, maybe dysfunctions that the, the team has. And here's one list that's found in the, the, the book, um, is that we know what when we study teams, we can kind of tell what they're doing. So one of, when one of these predictors of team effectiveness is absent, or weak, that would be a good time to intervene. So for example, um, the team has to have a, a clear goal, an elevating goal, something that people are uh, committed to that's motivating. Um, it's got to have a structure that actually gets results and doesn't just encourage people to sit around playing video games or, or something like that. Um, you need to have competent team members. You've got to have people that have the competences necessary to get the, the work done. Um, Unified commitment, people have to be committed to the same thing. A collaborative climate where the relationships are healthy, there's respect shown, and there's the freedom to exchange information. Um, standards of excellence, uh, there needs to be some type of accountability so that people uh, uh, um, uh, perform up to the level that's expected. Um, since a team occurs in a larger organizational context, they, there generally needs to be some type of external support and recognition so that, they can, so that the team feels that they are part of the bigger organization and that their goals, accomplishing their goals, uh, are accomplishing something uh, uh, that affects the entire uh, company. And then principled leadership, meaning leaders that are committed to doing the right thing and that are committed to accomplishing the goal rather than just trying to amass power or, or um, whatever for themselves. Rather than uh, leading to benefit themselves, they're leading to benefit the, the team. Now, you might be familiar with uh, Lencioni's uh, book that's been popular for uh, quite a while, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Uh, these uh, characteristics of team excellence are, are quite similar. Um, it's interesting, uh, Lencioni's uh, book is, some people call it pop management, but it turns out that he is so his his principles are all empirically uh, driven. The data indicating uh, uh, that these dysfunctions that he describes really are dysfunctions are true, and it's, it's an excellent all-around uh, uh, textbook. 
All right, now the second leadership uh, decision is when once the uh, uh, a leader, either the designated or regular team member, decides that it's time to intervene, there's, uh, I got to ask myself the question, how, how should I intervene? Should I inter intervene internally, inside of the team, or externally? So should I go outside of the team? Do we need something that requires interaction with the outside of the team? For example, to help figure out what type of intervention is necessary, uh, an internal action would be needed if there's conflict between uh, group members and the group members are not collaborating, they're not uh, combining forces to work more effectively together than they would separately. Um, another uh, uh, internal leadership action would be if the team goals are unclear, if people don't know what they're trying to accomplish, if people don't know what their roles are, those would be examples that would require uh, internal leadership actions. Now, maybe uh, uh, something in the, uh, in the team is not going well because of something happening outside of the team, that would require external uh, leadership actions. For example, if the organization is not providing the proper support to the team, if there's not enough team members, if the funds are short, if um, the goals keep changing, if people feel uh, uh, unvalued in the proper in the uh, larger organization, that would require external leadership actions, interaction with the outside people outside of the team, so that the external support um, becomes available for the team to accomplish its purpose. So that's the second leadership decision, and then the third leadership d uh, dimension is. If you decide that you need some type of internal action, the third question in this model is to ask, should I intervene to meet task or relational needs inside the team? Now we've seen, we've seen this division between task and relationship before. So we can look at the needs of the team. What is the te team needing? Because a team has to get work done, but they've got to do it together. So there's both task needs and relationship uh, needs. So task needs would be, might be things like getting the job done, making decisions, solving problems, adapting to changes, making plans, achieving goals, all the things that are needed to get the job done. And relationship, uh, relational needs would be things necessary for having um, uh, healthy relationships and uh, being able to coordinate one's efforts, like developing a positive climate that people want to contribute to, solving interpersonal problems and conflicts, um, satisfying members' needs. Uh, that's one of the big values of uh, teamwork is that um, if, if things start going wrong in a person's life, hopefully you're going to get a, a, a emotional support and a, um, informational support from, from other people. And the the need to develop cohesion so that communication can occur more easily and there's a greater willingness to, to communicate and um, work together. So if this third decision is if there's um, an internal, uh, if, if the needs are internal, should the leader focus on making a change that will meet a task need or a relational need? And so once this decision is made, um, if internal leadership actions are necessary, and for example, the leader decides that they need to respond to some task needs, the leader can do things like goal focusing, structuring the group for results, facilitating decision making, basically take whatever actions are necessary to meet the needs. And the same thing for uh, when relational uh, needs exist within the, uh, the group. Coaching, working on collaboration, managing conflict, um, perhaps having a, uh, a third person negotiate between a couple uh, people that are in conflict, and, and so on. So you find out what the need is, and then you have an action that responds to the need. So that would be the internal leadership actions. But, but remember, the, the, one of the questions was, is it internal or external? And if it's external, that means you go out to the outside environment and you do what's necessary. Might be networking, building more connections, might be advocating to get more resources, uh, negotiating support, um, buffering, protecting people from uh, things that they perceive as dangerous or changes that are going to be uh, uh, costly, and so on. So those are the, the actual leadership actions that are taken after the diagnosis occurs. 
Now here's the, the final figure for Hill's model of team leadership, and it, it looks pretty complicated, but let me remember that first one when there were uh, um, three circles. Up here is kind of like this monitor, um, monitoring the situation, and then this part is uh, deciding what type of action to take, and the actu actual action to take, and then this third part is to evaluate if the changes have been uh, uh, effective or not or if we've got to keep working on these changes. And once the changes have been effective, you go back up here and start monitoring it again. So I, I would probably say this figure 12.1 is not a masterpiece, but once you get an overview of Hill's model, you can say, yeah, I can see what, uh, what these, uh, all these different pieces mean. Um, so uh, here's the, the final model that's in the, uh, the, the book.